Welcome to King of Glory Lutheran Church in Boise, Idaho, on this Sunday, January 31st, 2021, the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. This is my last Sunday preaching to you here at King of Glory. I will be moving on to other adventures, and so will you. Pastor Connie Winter Yulberg will soon be joining you as your pastor. In the meantime, during the month of February, if you are on our email list, you will receive invitations to worship at other area churches in the Treasure Valley on their online worship services or a worship service produced by King of Glory Lutheran Church. Let's begin our worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling power. Amen. Rise, shine, you people, Christ the Lord has entered. Our human story, God in him is centered. He comes to us by death and sin surrounds. Freedom, light and life and healing. All men and women who by guilt are driven now are forgiven. Come celebrate your banners high unfurling, your songs and prayers against the darkness hurling. To all the world go out and tell the story of Jesus' glory. Tell how the Father sent the Son to save us. Tell of the Son who life and freedom gave us. Tell how the Spirit calls from every nation. God's new creation. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are 
seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone, the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name I myself will hold accountable, but any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation great are your works O Lord pondered by all who delight in them majesty and splendor mark your deeds and your righteousness endures forever you cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. Because they are done in truth and equity. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the eighth chapter. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The gospel for this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany is from Mark, the first chapter. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Word of God. Word of life. Thanks be to God. Every now and then, someone tells me that they're still thinking about a sermon I preached a week ago or a month ago. Remember how you said, and it always surprises me and catches me off guard, and Usually, no, I don't remember what I said at all. Often as not, it's a sermon I thought was awful. You work hard to come up with something to say, stumble around words 
to say, and when you are done, you conclude you can't, could, you can't possibly put people through this. So you cut out as much of it as you can and preach it as fast as you can and get it over with as quickly as possible for you and for them. And that is always when someone comes up to you and says, Pastor, I felt like you were speaking directly to me today. Do you have a copy of that sermon I could have? And you quickly come to the realization that if God speaks to someone while you're speaking to everyone, you had nothing to do with it. You proclaim the word of God as best you can and get out of the way. A fellow named Michael Green once wrote, preaching is such a humbling thing. You feel such a fool and you really do. Who am I to stand here and tell you what I think you need to know? What do I know about the troubles of your life? What authority do I have to speak to your life? Who do I think I am preaching to you? On the other hand, it's my job and it's my calling. I preach to you because you expect me to and because we all believe somehow in these few minutes, God will find a way to speak to us. In one of her journals, writer May Sarton quotes the Nobel Prize winning Italian author Luigi Perandello, who said, one cannot choose what one writes, one can only choose to face it. And I think that's the way it is with preachers. One cannot choose what one preaches, one can only choose to face it. But then perhaps that's the way it is with congregations too. If God is faithful and deigns to inhabit something so foolish as a Sunday sermon, then maybe you have no choice either. If the spirit of Christ is truly present in this moment, it's not because we had anything to do with it. If God wants to speak to you, then God will get through to you one way or another and there is nowhere you can run to be out of the sound of God's voice. If the Spirit of Christ is truly present in this moment, then maybe, maybe one cannot choose the message one hears. One can only choose to face it, to face God, no matter what God would do with us. When the Sabbath came, Mark tells us, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his, pre at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as one of the scribes. They were astounded at his teaching. Wouldn't you like to be astounded, astonished and astounded by what you hear in church? Wouldn't you like to hear some great preaching, something with the power to change your life? Maybe, by the grace of God, you'd get at least a taste of it here once in a while. But I think we all look for a word of God that will pull our lives together, explain the mysteries that baffle us, and make our chaotic lives mean something. With a little patience, you might be able to find a pretty good teacher, or at least you, you might find a preacher who is lucky enough now and then to come up with a pretty good sermon. But none of us preach like Jesus. We all preach like the scribes. The scribes in our gospel story were the biblical scholars of their time, the experts who could give you an answer on any, everything. But they were only secondhand teachers. They could only interpret what God had already spoken in the scriptures. But Jesus speaks firsthand, straight from the mouth of God, with authority. And everyone went home amazed. Imagine what it must have been like to hear the word of God proclaimed by Jesus himself. It would be astounding, amazing. It would be totally new. It would be the presence of God. And yet no one, no one comes to faith in this story. No one's life has changed. No one decides to follow Jesus. They've been wonderfully entertained. They've been, they're all amazed and astonished, and they can't stop talking about it. They tell everyone, and they make Jesus famous. But no one believes in Jesus. No one's life has changed, except 
the life of that man with an unclean spirit. He has become the enemy of God. He is openly hostile to Jesus. He's the closest thing to evil that synagogue has ever seen. He needs help and he knows it. And standing right in front of him is the one person who could change his life. And yet he wants none of it. He's got his own conspiracy theories and he prefers them. Thank you very much. He resists Jesus, tries to send Jesus away, tries to stop Jesus from saying the word that could set him free. He has encountered the Holy One of God and he knows it. This is his chance. His life could change and never be the same again. And it scares the hell out of him. Or rather, he finds the word of Jesus such great fire, he'd rather hold on to the hell he knows than risk the purification that could set him free. He is suffering from a demonic madness. His life is a living hell. Jesus could set him free. He knows that, but he is afraid that the changes Jesus will make in his life will destroy him. Everyone else just thought Jesus was impressive. The man with an unclean spirit knows Jesus is the Holy One of God and that he doesn't stand a chance. He will never be the same again. And he's right. If Jesus takes action, his life will be changed. His old life, everything he knew, will be dead. It's hell. But it's, he's never lived any other way. If Jesus silences him now, he has no idea what tomorrow will bring. It would be like jumping off a cliff to him. And surely you know what that's like. You've been there. Maybe you're not crazy mad with demons, but you know what it's like to be haunted by your past, unable to break free of bad habits that enslave you, possessed by sins and secrets you can't bear to tell anyone else. There are so many things you're ashamed of, anger and hurt and sorrow that hang on you like chains. But if you let God break, you, break them free, you wonder if you will know how to live without them. There's a memory of what someone did to you, what they took away from you. How can you forgive that? But without the grace to forgive it, it sets its needles in your sore skin every day, and you are so tired of it. Oh yeah, we know what it's like. We've prayed to God to heal us, and at the same time drawn back from God's healing touch and crying out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. If Jesus Christ really enters into your life with authority, you could lose so much. You could lose life as you know it. If Jesus decides to take action on us, our lives will be changed. Our old lives, everything we knew, will be dead. Maybe it's hell, but we've never lived any other way. If Jesus silences us now, who has any idea what tomorrow will bring? It could be like jumping off a cliff into an unknown future. They were all amazed, Mark says. And kept on asking one another, what is this? What is this? They couldn't stop asking each other. What is this? They said again and again to one another, as if daring each other to believe, as if hoping someone would take the first step so the rest of them could follow. Maybe they hoped someone would say, oh, it's nothing. This Jesus, he's a good teacher. You could learn a few things from him. A lot of his sayings make a good tweet. But it's not like you have to let him change your life or anything. And then they would just let him go. And Monday, when someone asked them what they did this weekend, they could just say, oh, nothing much. And pick up the old hurts and habits and sorrows and memories where they left off. Maybe it's hell, but at least it's familiar. Or maybe they hoped someone would say, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And maybe if I follow him, he will command me, and I will have to obey him. 
Maybe if I keep on following him, my life will never be the same. Maybe I'll have to let it, let, listen to someone who tells me what I don't want to hear. And maybe if you were looking for the fire of God in your life, you would pray God to speak to you. Maybe you would be bold enough to pray, command me, Jesus. Command me, Jesus. Break the chains of the past and the fears of the present. Destroy the old me with my secrets and habits. Forgive what shames me and heal what grieves me. Teach me to let go of everything but you. Remember my sins no more, O oh Lord, and teach me for, to forget what I cannot forgive. Enter my life with authority. Take action on me. Go ahead, speak with authority. Challenge my preconceptions. Nudge me out of my comfort zone. Tell me what I don't want to hear. I'm listening. Lead me. Lead this community of faith, this church. Lead us down some new path to where we've never been before, where we, where we won't, couldn't, couldn't possibly know where we're going, but only knowing that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. This is all we know. We don't know how to live any other way, but maybe we would never live that way again. Today, a few hours after you hear this sermon, or maybe right this moment while you're listening, I will be hopping into my overpat car and I will drive away from Boise and King of Glory and who knows if I'll ever be back. And who knows where I'll go next or what will happen next in my life or in yours. I certainly don't. I'll probably end up some other church's interim pastor or even if not, even if I never have another sermon to mention it in, you know, I'll probably end up talking to some guy in a bar or some woman on a street, people who eventually ask me what I do for a living and end up telling me their life stories, telling me about their unclean spirits, the things about themselves they can't stand but can't live without either. I'll be ready for the hostility that usually comes, the vitrolic accusations that Christians are the closest thing to evil they've ever seen, how they've been hurt by the churches they've known, and, and the preachers, well, they're the worst of them. They probably need help as much as I do. Wish to God they could change their life. And yet, like most of us, they want none of it. We've all got our conspiracy theories and preferred worldviews, no matter what the Bible says. But I get it. They haven't resisted Jesus any more than I have. Tried to stop Jesus from saying the word that would set us all free. And what will you do? Where will you go? What will happen next for you and for King of Glory Lutheran Church? And what will happen for Pastor Connie Winter Uhlberg, who, who no doubt also wonders what God is up to, what new path will take her to some place where she's never been before, and yet who is ready to accept the humbling task of preaching like a fool to you, just proclaiming the word of God as best she can and getting out of the way in hopes it will be Christ speaking to your heart with authority and who accepts the challenge of leading you where neither of you won't, couldn't possibly know where you're going, but only knowing that God's hand is leading you and God's love supporting you. God is calling you, calling it adventures of which you ne cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown to some other side of this pandemic moment. And if you are lucky, it will be God's own self you encounter there, the Holy One of God. And neither you nor your pastor nor this beloved church will ever be the same again. And if you, if you are lucky, it will scare the hell out of you. It will be an adventure worth sacrificing everything you know, and you will find the word of Jesus such great fire. You will let go of the hell you've known and 
even let go of the bit of heaven on earth you've known and risk the purification that could set you free. Jesus could set us free, terrifyingly, awesomely free. We are in the presence of God. Christ, the Holy One of God, has entered this moment of our lives. Jesus, we have no idea what tomorrow will bring, no idea of what actually following you, following you will mean for our lives. But speak to us, Christ Jesus. Amaze and astound us. Get through to us one way or another that there is nowhere we can run from the sound of your voice. We cannot choose what we want to hear from you, Jesus. We can only choose to face it. Face the awesome fire of God. Only say the word, Lord Jesus, and we shall be healed. Amen. our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ throughout the world, prophets, teachers, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders, for the church and its ministries, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all God's works in creation, plants and animals, water and soil, forests and farms, and for those tasked with protecting our natural resources and all that exist, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For government and leaders, cities and nations, rescue professionals and legal aid attorneys, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well-being of civil society, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those living with HIV, AIDS, those stricken with COVID-19, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or homeless, and all in any need. For caregivers, hospice workers, doctors and nurses, and technicians, nursing homes and rehabilitation centers, and home health aides, we pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For the concerns of this congregation, those who travel, those absent from worship, those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries, those who are homebound or isolating at home in this pandemic, for the people of God in this place and for other needs in our community, let us pray. Have mercy on us, O oh God. For the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism, in thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in the Lord, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people spoken or silent. For the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. As with gladness men of old did the guiding star behold, as with joy they hailed its light, leading onward beaming bright, so most gracious Lord may we evermore be led by Thee. As they offered gifts most rare at Thy cradle rude so may we with holy joy, pure and free from sin's alloy, all our costliest treasures bring, Christ to Thee, our heavenly King. Let us pray. Holy God, light of the universe, teacher of truth, giver of goodness, we hear your word in the scriptures, proclaiming to us your wisdom and inviting us to follow your call. For speaking this word, we thank you, O God. 
We thank you, O God. Your word came among us in Jesus, our brother, who preached your righteousness, healed the sick, and revived the brokenhearted. For giving us this word, we worship you, O God. We worship you, O God. By your spirit, bless all who receive this word, that upheld by the mystery of the body of Christ, we may be light for the world, revealing the brilliance of your Son. For sustaining us with your word, we praise you, O God. We praise you, O God. Blessed are you, holy God, around us, with us, and in us, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. God, the creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, our comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Son of God, eternal Savior, source of life and truth and grace, Word made flesh, whose birth among us hallows all our human race. You, our head, who throned in glory for your own will ever plead, Fill us with your love and pity, heal our wrong and help our need. As you, Lord, have lived for others, so may we for others live. Freely have your gifts been granted, freely and reign among us, King of love and Prince of peace. Hush the storm of strife and passion, bid its cruel discord cease. By your patient years of toiling, by your silent hours of pain, Quench our fevered thirst of pleasure, stem our selfish greed of gain. Son of God, eternal Savior, source of life and truth and grace, would make flesh whose birth among us hallows all our human race. By your praying, by your willing, that your people should be one. Grant, O oh, grant our hopes fruition, here on earth your will be done. Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.